Our next two speakers uh, are sort of working together. Uh, first, we have John Squires, and John is going to lay some of the groundwork for uh, Danielle Chi's comments uh, in, in presentation afterwards. John is a research wildlife biologist with the Re Rocky Mountain Research Station located in Missoula, Montana. From 1991 to 1997, he studied the seasonal changes in habitat use patterns of northern goshawks nesting in Wyoming. Since 1997, John is a member of the Rocky Mountain Research Station's Missoula Wildlife Unit, studies the ecology and conservation of Canada lynx and wolverine in the northern Rocky Mountains. John also remains active in rat raptor conservation and management through a new study investigating ferruginous hawks and energy development. I've never said that word before, ferruginous. Uh, Frank just coached me on that. I hope I did okay. Thank you very much. John? Thank you for the invite to um, talk about lynx. We're kind of shifting gears from a, this species doesn't affect ungulates, but terrorizes snowshoe hares. We've been researching lynx for, um, since 19, the winter of 1997-98 was when we first started our research in Montana. And we've kept it going through these years, kind of limping along as different funding cycles change. Um, but right now, like, like I said in the introduction, I'm supposed to, my charge was to talk about the scientific basis from what we know on some issues such as distribution, habitat selection, some mortality patterns, and, and some issues that we're kind of researching where the state of science is. And then Daniel's going to talk about the uh, more the management issues that uh, agencies are struggling with. So, um, our first question is looking at, you know, how has the change in distribution, our understanding of these distributions changed since the listing in 2000? It's a northern species, you know, it's mainly um, in Canada, but we're primarily interested in these, con these uh, southern populations in the contiguous U.S. Uh, as part of my research. Uh, it, Kevin McKelvey and Keith Aubrey and our vet Ortega um, put together a study in uh, a book that we all published in 2000 that looked at the distribution of links based on known um, sightings. And these were uh, from 1842 to 1998. Um, these are very reliable sightings and saying, what's the pattern of distribution? Well, you know, if you're looking at this just casually, I mean, they look like they're fairly broadly distributed in the Western United States. But we now know through um, surveys and, and just research in general that lynx are really fairly restricted in where they are. Um, they're in the Okanagan, in Washington, in Montana. They're from the, um, this is the Purcell Mountain Range by Libby, Montana, over to Glacier Park, down through the Bob Marshall Complex to the Garnett Range, about the I-90. There's lynx, a native population there that was or were, we don't know quite what the status is, in the Wyoming range, and also on the east side of Yellowstone Lake. We do know, um, great deal where they're not. Um, we have had, um, you know, th literally tens of thousands of miles or kilometers of survey looking for lynx in uh, the area of southern Montana, those island ranges, and they're not there uh, along Lo uh, Lolo Pass and um, south of Libby, most of Yellowstone GOIA doesn't support lynx populations as far as we can tell, nor does the um, Sunlight Basin by Crandall Kirk and on the, on the Beartooth. So, we, well, you know, and then in the continental United States, so these are the two populations we talked about, the Okanagan, the ones in Washington, there's lynx in Minnesota, and this is really an optimistic depiction of it, but it's actually just in the very tip of the arrowhead is where lynx are, and then in Maine. So, you know, we conclude that, um, you know, there are really not very many lynx populations in the contiguous United States, and they consist of few individuals. And all the populations are, con are contiguous with the Canadian border with Canada, except the Great Yellowstone area. Uh, maybe that area is large enough to support a population through time. Second question is, what do we know about the health of lynx population in at least Montana, where we have studied them, and what are important mortality agents? We've been, like I mentioned earlier, we've been studying this for 10 years, and actually during that time, we've been able to empirically define um, vital rates in terms of adult survivorship, kitten productivity, um, mortality rates. And so based on those um, empirically derived vital rates, 
we're able to look at um, lambda values and it appears that our best guess is that um, in CD Lake, which is a, our main study area just um, northeast of Missoula, Montana, um, we think that population is slightly declining. And um, in the Purcell Mountain Range, which is over by that area of my Libby that I, pro that I pointed out earlier, it's maybe slightly increasing. And so there's a sort of sync dynamic or going on or across the state, though we think that Montana is much more steely like all across the Bob Marshall complex. And so we think in general, links are declining. Um, that's certainly been borne out in the last two years where um, typically you would have 10 to 15 females per study area. In the last two years, we've only been able to capture one female in um, Sea Lake area and five up in the Purcell mountain range. And so something seems to be going on with females in particular. Um, looking more mortality rates, our modeling has shown that what's the major issue that affects lynx is adult survivorship. And there's basically uh, three factors that kill lynx. Uh, humans, predation, and starvation. And this is based on um, 60 mortalities. Human factors are mostly, um, can be broken down into mainly trapping related accidents really in terms of people killing lynx incidentally. Um, you know, two of them were, were walked from our study area to Canada and were just trapped. Uh, one was killed in a wolverine set when it was in, in Montana. They used three, three, you know, 330 cona bears to, um, a, on a ground, on a land set, and that killed lynx. Um, one died of a trap mortality or of trauma where the, where the person just let the lynx go and it you know, walked away and it looked good as a trapper. It died, you know, 50 feet from the trap. And then it's like this animal died with breaking off a tie wire where they just used bark, you know, just bailing wire to tie it onto a tree. It broke that off and then starved with a trap on its foot. And then six were uh, killed by Ill illegal shooting, poaching, houndsmen, you know, and associated with lion hunting. And, and then we've had only one road kill. Links typically aren't killed by um, cars very frequently because there's really very low adjacency and that lynx habitat is mostly um, above where most roads are. A little different in some of the reintroduced populations like in Colorado and the one that was done in New York a long time ago. So if we look at um, predation, this is a typical skull of a lynx killed by a lion. Um, lions are a major predator of lynx in Montana. Um, and all the predation that we've documented is through the non-snow season. And so there is exclusion in that when you get deep snows, lions go to lower elevations to follow ungulate herds and lynx um, are, you know, we don't see, we don't see um, the only other predator that's with lynx would be coyotes and we don't see a lot of evidence of that predation. Then in the non-snow period, um, lions are up with where lynx are and that's when we see the, the mortalities. And most of those mortalities are adults. Um, if we look at starvations, uh, and this is relevant to habitat, this is where we put our focus on habitat management, is that most of our lynx mortalities are in the winter and the early spring. Uh, so that is the lynx's crunch time. You know, we, you know, lynx also have these walkabouts where they walk long distances. You know, like in the Wyoming Range, we've documented an animal going 700 kilometers up to Montana and back repeatedly every year for three years. And um, but by the time the winter comes, they all hunker down into their main home ranges and they don't wander around. And that's when they typically starve the winter and spring. So what what about habitat associations? This is an incredible you know to understand lynx you know. Of course, you have to understand snowshoe hares, but this is a very specific predator in how it uses habitat. You know, this is just GPS data from two individuals. It's just an anecdotal old story, but it's interesting to look at how these individuals made a vote on how they used habitat. You know, areas they liked, areas they avoided, areas they liked, areas they avoided in this checkerboard pattern. And you wouldn't see this pattern for wolverines or um, lions or grizzly bears. Or, or many other species, but lynx are very specialized in how they use habitat, and that's one of the issues in terms of management that is important to appreciate. So if we take a little virtual tour of where they avoided, you know, it's that. And so these areas that they're avoiding 
aren't parking lots necessarily, they're thinned areas, so links are extremely sensitive to thinning. And so thinning is an issue. Where do they, you know, like in this same landscape, where would they be using and preferring would be these types of habitats. And so this is an interesting one up here because um, this is a thin, obviously a thin stand, but the animals are using it again. They're saying this is habitat that's suitable. And if we look at that, it's regeneration. Typically in the literature, especially from the northern literature, you think about lynx using um, 15, 20 year old region and, you know, after fires is kind of the classic lynx habitat. That's not the case in Montana. I mean, this region is probably, you know, 50 years old, so certainly they use it, but it's, it's at a lower and a slower rotation than simply, than often described. So this is now a different kind of data. This is actually backtracking data, 700, 600 kilometers of following lynx and quantifying across many individuals. And so what's the gestalt of winter habitat used for lynx can be summarized into, you know, large, this is a logistic regression um, analysis, um, large diameter spruce fir trees, both in the mid and the overstory, um, in deep snow with abundant snowshoe hairs and very high horizontal cover. It, and, and they avoid areas of small tree cover and um, open. And so that's kind of the winter kind of gestalt. And so what's that look like? It's, at least in Montana, it's, it's that. Um, it's conifer boughs touching the snow surface. I mean, that's what holds snowshoe hairs, horizontal cover, and that's what lynx require, especially in the winter. In the summer, the story changes a little bit, and it kind of lose that kind of old or mature forest structure, and, and, and they shunt into kind of in younger structures where you see you know, shrubs and small diameter trees. And so they, they switch, they use a mosaic. And this is just graphically um, using GPS data just to illustrate the point. If these, these are winter points off an individual in the, on the Purcell Mountain Range, you know, where they're avoiding this area and they're avoiding some of this, you know, in the summer, they just broaden their niche out. They still use the same mature forest in the summer too, but they broaden into a, a, a wider um, summer feeding niche. And that reflects changes in hair abundance in the summer these young stands are very productive in producing young hares or leverets and hunt and lynx hunt them. And but in the winter, um, there's their sinks and either hares either get killed or they move physically to um, a mature stand when they have cover. And I, I wanted to try to, I was asked to try to talk about Wyoming to the degree that I could. And there's not very good data from Wyoming on how lynx use habitat. Um, these are game and fish data. I was asked by the game and fish to augment this data by trapping um, one, at least one individual, one length, the last one that we knew of in the big piney area, and put satellite telemetry, which I did. And, you know, there are just some, I just want to make some comments, but preface by that the science behind these aren't very well developed. Um, links are very limited in the GYA in their spatial extent. They're um, like it's you know, the Wyoming Range, Union Pass, Togi Pass, possibly Arizona Lakes area, um, Heart Lake, on the east side of Yellowstone Lake. Uh, also, they use young versus old. They have a preference for very, very dense, super dense lodgepole pine um, as winter habitat, and also mature um, lodgepole pine that's falling down for, um, for foraging. And many logical pine stands never turn to lynx habitat. A lot of the Yellowstone fire never turned from lynx habitat, ha lynx habitat from seedling to coal. This is just oh, oil gas. We never really had. This. There's not much of a scientific basis to understand the effects of oil gas. This is the Myrna proposed Myrna field. You couldn't put it in a worse spot for lynx, I don't think. But we don't really know how this population would respond to that. And there's really no science to guide us because most lynx habitat isn't in oil fields. Denning habitat, before we started this, there were three, um, three dens from two females. Um, in Washington was the guidance for all the agencies to make denning decisions. Since then, we found 56 dens from 19 females. Um, and I'll just go through this kind of quickly. We, you know, they typically den in May, they have two to three kittens. But the issue is they have high holes. I mean, dead and down woody debris is hugely important for denning and most of these are mature forest stands. So mature forest stands are key for denning. Though, although that's true, we don't think that mature stands are really 
ever limiting. And so, I mean, we don't think that that's a management need given the size of their home ranges. Even, you know, they have very large areas and we assume that in these home ranges, they have ample dens, that's not limiting. So, you know, climate change, you know, the animal is, is absolutely physically adapted to being in a deep, deep snow environment, you know, huge feet for uh, a 20 pound cat, size of a mountain lion. But, you know, they're very sensitive to disturbance. And so clearly, I think disturbance is gonna be affecting lynx, you know, quicker than climate change as climate changes disturbance patterns in boreal forests and alters them into a more frequent fire interval where, um, like in Washington state, 40% of lynx habitat burned the last two years ago and large amounts of lynx habitat in Wyoming, I mean, Montana is burned. And in, like in Colorado, you're seeing a lot of insect outbreak too that might be impacting lynx. So disturbance patterns are huge for lynx. Um, and, and, and we saw early, earlier illustrated, they're very sensitive to the changes in pattern, landscape pattern by agency efforts to mitigate increased disturbance patterns like, you know, forest health, and health initiatives. Boreal forests are also identified as being the most vulnerable for climate change and the REC impacts globally to the extent of forest cover. So to understand climate change, we have to understand where they are now and we're kind of struggling with that currently. Um, we did looking at 60 home ranges relative to um, available home ranges across the distribution in Montana. We're asking what, where are lynx currently, what is lynx habitat um, at the broad scale so that we can move that through time through climate modeling. Um, using this suite of variables that deal with topography, vegetation, landsat, and climate. These are different than the climate variables I'll talk about later. But where lynx are, are in mid-elevation zones. So this quadratic terms, you know, it's, it's the mid zone, it's not high, it's not low, and that's important for, for management. So they're very restricted into these mid-elevation boreal forests in low topographic roughness. And so, like in Glacier Park, they, they're not in the center of the park, they're on the edges. They select ranges like around Sealy and the Purcell Mountains that have this kind of rolly habitat structure compared to more bisected, the Wyoming Range compared to the Teton Range. And so roughness is an issue and where links is suitable habitat. So we make a, a probability surface of where it is. You can see lynx habitat we think is very passively distributed across Montana and, and limited, and that lynx are rare. You know, fairly, um, I think they're a lot rarer than grizzly bears, so, you know, by probably half or less. And so if we um, compare these using kind of standard um, classification modeling, um, you know, K-fold classification modeling, um, the model performs pretty well. But we're trying to improve this because we don't, don't really have a, a snowshoe hair component, I mean a, a forest component to add to this model. And that's what we're trying to do now for climate. So I'm going to go through these quick. We're, we're, our climate modeling is based on some work that was done by the um, climate group in Washington. We are using, um, you know, these time periods and that we are um, projecting these variables to ask the question, this is our first thing, is there, an, in, is there a, an impact? I mean, is there a relationship to climate to links? And we found that there are significant relationships, but as of yet, we don't think these are meaningful or interpretable because of our problems of looking at availability given the huge pixel size of climate data is available, even the downscaled models. So um, we're still stay tuned on the climate issue. Winter recreations are my last issue. It's an issue that's certainly of interest to the agencies, how to links and Wolverines too respond to recreation. We've been trying to raise the bar by, of that by asking recreators to carry GPS units and to quantify how they're using habitats in Colorado. And so when we do that, you can see this is Vail Pass, Colorado. You know, these are snowshoers, snowmobilers, ski skiers, and snowmobile hybriders, where snowmobiles are, they use snowmobiles and access to backcountry. And they have very different habitat use patterns. And so you could create different resource selection functions for each of these different users. And, and so if you look overlap them, you can see that spatially these users are very different. And then we track capture links here and ask the question of how links are using these landscapes relative to these recreators. And we did the same thing in Northern Idaho, or in a, in a, um, near McCall, Idaho. And uh, we captured six wolverines right in the center of these recreation zones to ask the question how they're using recreation. And so 
I kind of view these, like this is Vail Pass again, these are hybrid skiers and people are using snowmobiles and skiing. And it's kind of a spatial hypothesis to ask, you know, are links doing, are you using these areas at all? Are they using this type of an area that's open? Are they using it in the day versus night? I mean, some of those different questions on how these carnivores are inter interacting with recreation. And so it's an area of very little science. We're trying to put a little to it and uh, we should have results in a year or two. So with that, I'm going to stop and um, take questions and then Daniel will talk about the management. Yes. Um, so can you can you map the snowshoe hair or is someone mapping the snowshoe hair uh, snowshoe hair population so that you go along with where your links are? No. I mean it's amazing how little we know about where snowshoe hairs are and the densities where they are. And it's exceedingly difficult to determine, you know, their densities and then to map that across like a surface space. You no, know, either they're in the day or available for that. So my other follow up on that is Yeah, no, that would. The only, the only thing I would, I would suggest is though that um, southern hair populations tend to be low across the contiguous U.S. And uh, Maine might be an exception to that, but certainly in the western United States, where lynx are existing on snowshoe hair population that's similar to the cyclic lows in the north. And so hairs are extremely you know, low density from a, hair's or from a lynx's perspective. And there's no evidence of really cyclicity in hairs nor in length. And so we, you know, we can't you know, kind of play the game like you would in a cycle, like you can in the north to look at changes relative to hair density by due to cyclicity. Yes? Can you really discuss the population in Colorado? Is that because it's an experimental? Yeah. Or yes, I, that's correct. I mean, I, it's been declared successful and maybe it will be, but I don't think we know about the long term. Um, success. We know the Colorado population is certainly impacting Wyoming to some degree, meaning that the animals that were in Colorado actually walked to those last home ranges that animals lived in Wyoming, which is astonishing to think about, like, you know, flying an animal in an airplane from Quebec to Colorado and then let it go and then have it walk um, across the Red Desert and find those last two territories that links occupied in Big Piney. Um, but that's what they did, and we've had multiple animals recolonizing um, that part of Wyoming from Colorado. So lynx habitat is certainly obvious at a long distance from lynx.